Good morning to those of you joining us from the Pacific Northwest. Good afternoon for those of you who are joining us on the East Coast. And good evening to those of you who are joining us in the UK. It's so wonderful to have you for part two of our wonderful new series, um, Exploring Sephardic Judaism in the Modern Era with the amazing and uh, really wonderful Rabbi, uh, Senior Rabbi Joseph Dweck from the S&P Sephardic Community. This wonderful new program is through our Sephardic Digital Academy, through the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, a whole host of programs on history, Sephardic Judaism, um, in the modern era, as well as supporting Torah, Halakha, and more. If you're interested in learning more about all these different programs, please check out our website at sephardicbrotherhood.com slash Sephardic Digital Academy. Now, such a pleasure to introduce uh, a man who needs no introduction, nonetheless, um, so wonderful to have Rabbi Joseph Zweck, again, the senior rabbi of the S&P Sephardic community of the United Kingdom, as well as serves in many other capacities, including as the ecclesiastical authority of the Jewish Board of Deputies, as a part of the presidium and the steering, standing committee of the uh, Rabbinic uh, Council of Europe and so the Rabbinic Conference of Europe, excuse me, and so many other uh, institutions. So Rabbi Dweck, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Ethan. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you all again, uh, this, wherever it is that you are in time <laughs> across, the, across the globe. Um, which is so wonderful to be able to do this like this. Um, and so I think, of course, Ethan and the Sephardic Brotherhood, again, for the opportunity to be able to share with you. Um, and what we were going to speak about today is this is the second installment in the, um, in the series. And what we was to look at was to look at how the concepts that we looked at last time, and I will briefly summarize what it is that we did last time, how it is that they kind of came through and manifested um, for the Sparadim. And, um, and from that, I hope that next week we'll be able to look at really engaging in, in current times with regards to all of this, you know, this background. One of the things that we looked at last time was in deep history, right, with regards to the people of Israel. And my suggestion was that the, the aspects that we tend to identify in very general terms, right? And I think that it's important that these are general um, aspects regarding the Sfaradim as opposed to the Ashkenazim and how it is that we've approached the world, the way that we've engaged with our lives and our Judaism in the world um, has deeper roots than just what happened in Spain or what happened in Germany and France, or what happened in Eastern Europe. It has deeper roots. And those roots go all the way back, I suggested, to the early days of the, the development of our family before the nation even developed. And when I say our family, I'm talking the family of Israel. The family of Israel proper are the children of Yaakov Avinu, otherwise known as Israel. And that there was fundamental difference in the family way back then in terms of how it is that we should, we, the people of Israel, should engage in the world. This was not simply a result of being thrown into ghettos. This was not simply a result of being immersed in Andalusian culture. This reached further back into a fundamental argument, a fundamental difference of opinion between uh, essentially Yaakov, right, our forefather Yaakov, and some of his kids. Uh, and that specific argument was, should we, engage in the outside world with the other nations of the world, the other peoples of the world, and integrate ourselves into society with bringing what it is that we bring to society, or do we keep ourselves back? Do we build uh, boundaries and barriers, uh, perhaps even build walls between us and the world? And so the highlights of that last time were that we saw that Yaakov, when he finally set out to be able to live his life with his family after he leaves the house of Lavan, his his um, his uncle, and he and he faces down his brother, his twin brother Esav, Yaakov is interested in in integrating. His opinion is we should integrate into broader society, bring what it is we have in our family, bring what it is we have in terms of our belief, our, our understanding of God, our understanding of life, our understanding of the world and all how all of that integrate interacts to integrate that into the rest of society. And therefore Yaakov comes to a place called Shechem. This is his first engagement outside of his, you know, leaving his family. It says that he comes Shalem, to Shechem, he comes whole and complete in who he is and his family. 
And <laughs> everything bad happens in Shechem. Chazal actually say that Shechem is a makom, it is a place that is muhan le puranut, which means it's a place that for some reason seems historically to be set up for disaster. Everything bad happened in Shechem. And the first bad things happened in Shechem was this situation in where Yaakov comes with his children to the city. His daughter, uh, Dina, is abducted by the mayor or head of the city, raped by him, essentially. And then he's asked nicely by that same uh, leader to marry her. He says, look, I know I was a bit impetuous, but maybe, you know, we can actually make something work and integrate over here. And Yaakov actually sits down to have this dialogue with them and entertains the possibility seriously. Yaakov, Chazal say, is interested in setting up markets with this society, but his kids have other opinions. His children that come from his first wife, or Leah, right, which is the sister of Rahel, uh, namely uh, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda, the four of them have very different opinions as to how their father should engage in the world. So specifically in this instance, it's Shimon and Levi that take matters into their own hands. They sit as though they're negotiating with their father, but they end up massacring the entire city as vengeance for their sister. Yaakov is tremendously displeased with this. He is so upset with them as a result of it, but he tells them only one thing. As a result of what it is you've done with this city and my attempts at integration, you have made me muddy and ugly. I have no longer a capacity for interface into anything beyond my own family and my own world. And he really never forgives them for that. He never really gets over that to the point that even when he dies on his deathbed, this is the only thing that he mentions to Shimon and Levi. And he says, they better get their act together. Otherwise they're going to be in serious trouble. Reuven shows that he has differences of opinions with his father. Yehuda certainly shows that he has differences of opinions with his father because they engineer the sale of their brother Yosef. And Yosef, of course, is not one of their brothers from the same mother. He's a brother from another mother, another mother that is, you know, that includes a tremendous amount of jealousy. And the thing about Yosef is that Yaakov loves Yosef. He has a specific, special affinity towards Yosef because he sees in Yosef someone that is essentially like his own heart, a person that understands that the world is a place to be embraced, that the world is a place that we are supposed to integrate, that the most important thing that we can do is to be able to be ourselves in the world and to be able to draw from the world whatever it is that we need to assimilate in words. And that's an interesting word in English, isn't it? Assimilate has two meanings. Assimilate can either mean to dissipate into something or assimilate can mean to incorporate within oneself. And we meet it in the second sense, that Yaakov's interest, as was Yosef's interest, was to take all that they had from their grandfather, Abraham, and to bring it to the world, and to be able to take from the world what might enhance them. This was their mode of living. It's proved that this was their mode of living by how it is that we see Yosef living in Egypt. Yosef's life in Egypt is one in which he becomes Egypt for all intents and purposes. He literally becomes the face of Egypt. He's on every billboard. He's taken out by Paro in a convertible, driven all over the country so that everybody should see this handsome young face and identify nationally with who Egypt is, what it means to be an Egyptian citizen. And there's none other that can do it like Yosef can. Yehuda argues with this, thinks that Yosef is trouble before he even gets sold and sells him down literally the river in order to be able to get the family safe again, away from the troublemaker that Yosef is, and ultimately the trouble that his father has, which is only encouraged by Yosef being home. So they throw their father into tremendous um, uh, avelut, right? Tremendous, tremendous mourning as a result of saying to him that his son's been ripped apart by animals and he loves so dearly. They throw Yosef into a horrific situation down to Egypt. Like I mentioned last time, you know, there's no Chabad down there. Nobody's there to be able to help him out. What's going to happen with this kid? 17 years old, you know, there's huge problems. And the core issue essentially is, is do we integrate or don't we? Do we live in this world faithfully or do we spy on this world? Take from it what it is that we need and stay separate. And that is indeed what Yosef accuses his brothers of being. And he means it very seriously. It's not just some game that he's playing. 
He means it very seriously when he says you are spies. You live in this world like spies. You do not integrate. So we could spend much more time on that, but for this particular installment, we are going to recognize that as our backdrop and understand that the questions essentially that we deal with with regards to Sfaradim and Ashkenazim, and again, I'm talking in broad strokes because there are Sfaradim that believe that the way to be in this world is to build walls and stay separate. And there are Ashkenazim that believe that the way to live in this world is to integrate and embrace. But if we're going back to Sfarad, right? If we're going back to specifically Southern Sfarad, Andalusia, we're going to recognize that the world in their minds, yeah, the world of Harambam and his predecessors was one in which they were immersed. They saw within the world an expression of God. And I think that this is the most important key that we have to understand. That when I talk about Sfaradim, and I talk about it in the classical sense, this is what I this is the most important part of it for me. And since I'm giving the lecture today, it's going to be my approach to it. You're free to disagree with me in any capacity that you wish. But to me, as a Sfaradi, Sephardic Jew, as a person that comes from that collective heritage, the most important thing to me in that heritage is not how we approach halakha, is not how we approach learning a sugya in the Talmud, although those things are extremely important and a central part of the way that we look at Torah and relate to Torah. Those are extremely important. But I think that there is a, a, an overarching ideal beyond all of those that is most important. All of them, I believe, were most masterfully taught by the Andalusia's greatest, greatest son. And that, of course, I believe is indisputable, Maimonides. There's no one like Harambam that came out of that place. So, you know, you realize that, that you know, all that went into that place, whether it's Rabbi Yosef Ibn Megas, or whether it's uh, Rabbeinu Bahia Ibn Pakuda, or whether it is uh, even Shilomo Ibn Gabirol, yeah, who was not necessarily the highest Talmir Hakam, although he was certainly a Talmir Hakam. But nonetheless, you know, our liturgy that we read on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, if it wasn't for Rabbi Shilomo Ibn Gabirol, we would be dumb. We would have nothing to say. And the words that we have that he has given us are the most soaring, moving, splendid words in all of Jewish liturgy. It is absolutely staggering. And yet I will say unabashedly that the greatest one to come out of that place was Harambam. And it is true that Harambam had, had issue. He took issue with the poets. He thought that they went a little bit too far into their poetry and lost their footing in their sense of Torah and value. But there is one thing that I want to study with you today, specifically from Harambam, which I believe is at the soul of what it means to be a Sfaradi. And as I said, and I'm not going to keep making this disclaimer, there are many Ashkenazim who have taken this and have embraced this. But for us who claim connection to Sfarad, and to that tradition, it is our legacy. It's not just something that we take. It is our, it has been bequeathed to us by those who came before us. And that is this. We look at the world as an expression of God. We look at the world as his artwork. And when I say artwork, I mean it in no cheapened way, of course. When I say artwork, I mean it that to know God directly, to know God in his essence, as he is, is an impossibility for us. We have no access. That is also something that Harambam teaches us. We have no direct access to God. All that we have with God is what he's expressed from himself to us. And what he has expressed to us is creation, the entire universe and everything in it. 
And if we wish to get to know him, we must know his world. And that Harambam writes very explicitly. So that was the driving element. I'm going to show you that he writes this. I'm going to show you that this is at the heart of what it is that we're talking about. And I want you to remember that this is not something that Harambam, of course, devised on his own. This goes all the way back to the questions between Yosef and his brothers. So take a look at this. Bear with me with some text over here. This is a section of the Mishneh Torah written by Harambam and Hilchot Yosodei Torah. And in this section, he is talking about specifically the love of God. And what he says, essentially, his premise is, he asks, he says that we are obligated to love God. How do we know that we're obligated to love God? Because it says in the Torah, et Adonai that you are to love the Lord your God. With all of your heart, and all of your soul, and all of your strength and might. Harambam recognizes that that is a legal issue. If it is a command, then it's a law. And if it is a law, then it must be adhered to. And if it must be adhered to, we must understand the legal definitions, implications for it. And so Harambam asks a very simple question. He says, What is the way to love him? Now here he also says, to fear him. But that's included. I'm going to leave that for now for our purposes. All right? But I encourage you to study. How, what is the way to love God? Rambam's answer to that essentially is, to know him is to love him. And what you need to do in order to love him is to know him. And so he says, that at the time when a person studies, contemplates his actions, his creations that are wondrous and great, and you see in those things his wisdom, the wisdom of the Creator speaks to you through his creations. It is, it is immeasurable. Miyad hu ohev. He immediately loves. Because once you look at everything that is out there, everything around you, and you see that it is an act of the Creator, and you recognize the Creator through those things, you come to know Him. And once you come to know Him, you immediately love. You recognize that you have this love for what it is that's been put out for you. And I think that I'm going to pause here for one minute because I want to speak to you on this and we'll come back to it. Because I want, I want to understand what this means. And the reason why I'm pausing on it to explain what it is that this means is because, like I said, this is central. This is core to the nature of the Sfaradim that I am talking about. And that is that when we say to study the world is to be able to know God, that's not some abstract, uh, you know, uh, poetic idea. It is a concrete point. In the same way that if you have ever experienced the creative output of another human being that has impacted you and moved you in a positive way, if you have ever seen the, the, the artwork of a great artist, if you've ever seen the acting of a great actor, if you have ever read the literature of a great author, if you have ever seen the films of a great director or writer for that matter, and you have been moved by it, if you have ever listened to music of a great musician and it has moved you, it has changed you, it has touched you positively, you immediately love that person who created it, even if you have never directly met them. And that is why when you actually do get to meet them, 
you are shaken because you realize that you have such love for this person, such admiration for this person, because they've touched your soul, that you just want to tell them, I've seen what you've done. It has touched my heart. Thank you. If that is what happens to a human being, all the more so that it happens with God himself, who created the human beings, who create the things that move you. If for nothing else than that God created Rembrandt and Mozart, that you love him because you love them, and I'm just throwing in some, you know, over here that are pretty safe. That means that Mozart and Rembrandt are his creativity. They're his artwork, along with every everything else that we see in this world. And so the Rambam, back to the Rambam. So you understand what the Rambam is saying here. You understand what Harambam is pointing out over here. He's saying to keep your consciousness, your mind away from the world is to keep your consciousness and mind away from God. You understand how fundamentally different that can be to other ways of people in our family suggesting to connect to God. What Yehuda and his brothers were essentially saying, and I don't think in any way severe as it, it's actually put out today, but what they were saying was, we need to keep to ourselves. We need not to integrate. We need to be very careful that we will lose ourselves if we do. And the truth of the matter is that they're not wrong. There were descendants of Yosef that went way off the deep end because there are issues with what it is that I've just described. Isn't it possible that in your fervor and love for a musician, you idolize the musician? Isn't it possible that in your fervor and love for integrating this way, you or another person becomes the God? Well, the brother sat around and said, look, right? Say Chazal, look, this, the master of dreams is coming. They mocked their younger brother when he walked over them just before they sold him and called him the Baal HaHalomot, the master of dreams. Chazal say that that was just saying, this one's going to lead us all to the Baal, which is the granddaddy of Avodah Zarah in the ancient world of, of idol worship. And they weren't wrong. So the question is, how do we maintain this legacy? How do we embrace this tradition that is very, very proudly ours? That Harambam says to us at the end of this mamar, have a look, that it is so important to engage with the world. And where he says, He says, I'm going to actually take time in my book now to explain major principles about the works of God. And that basically is saying, I'm just going to give you some, you know, astronomy lessons and science lessons and biology lessons and things like that. Why? So that there will be an opening for a person who understands. For a person who understands to love God. As Hazal said in this regard, You do this, you study the world because from that you come to recognize and know the one who spoke and created the world. The Rambam writes in the Morin Nebuchim that that's when when Moshe Rabbeinu asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, show me your ways. Show me yourself, first he said. I want to see you. God said, you can't see me, Moses. You cannot see me directly. I can't do that for you. Not while you're in a, in a, in a physical body. 
So then Moshe says, well, then at least show me your ways. Because as we said, if you show your ways, if you show me your works, then from that I will know you. And what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu answer Moshe? How does he show him his ways? He says, okay, Moshe, that I will do for you. I'm not just going to show you my ways. I'm going to show you all of my good. All my goods I'm going to give you. So Harambam says, what is this kol to vi that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe he's going to give him? Take a look over here. He says, Omnam omro kol to vi. When God says to Moshe, I'm going to show you all of my good. What is that referring to, says Harambam? It hints to God showing Moshe everything he made. Everything he made. About which he said, God saw kol, everything that he made. And it was good, very good. That's kol tov, kol tuvi. The entirety of creation. When he showed him, what I mean to say is, And when I say, by the way, that Moshe, that Kadosh who showed Moshe these things, I'm not just saying that he, like, you know, he brought a giraffe in front of Moshe and showed him, here's a giraffe, and then showed him a hippo. What he did was, he showed him the entire matrix of creation. That's what he says over here. He showed them them tivam. He showed them their nature vehekshiram, and their interconnections, their interconnections one to the other in a full broad matrix. So stop for a minute and understand what it is that Harambam is saying over here. Harambam, the Spaniard from Cordoba. What is he saying? He's saying that to know God, when Moshe asked. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to know his ways, through that, to know him. He says, show me your ways, and therefore I will know you, or through that I will know you. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I will do that for you, Moshe. I'm going to show you every detail of my creation and its interface and interconnection with every other detail of my creation, which essentially is saying is, I will show you the full matrix of my work in its wholeness and from that you will come to know me. That's a pretty powerful statement because Harambam is saying not only do we see from the Morin Nebuchim that that is God's expression in this world he's saying that we have an obligation to look at it and to study it in order to love him to know him so that we would love him. And that is something that has genuinely been the legacy of the Sfaradim. And it's something that if we are not careful, we will lose because we will feel self-conscious about it. Next to the alternative opinions and it is okay that those opinions are there. They've been there from the very beginning of our family for over 3,000 years. But we must be careful. As Sfaradim, not to give way to self-consciousness in front of the other members of our family that have difference of opinion. And we must know that our way is an old, foundational, rooted way. And that, as I wrote in an, in an, in an, in an essay, in a piece, in response to, Rabbi, to Professor Haim Soloveitchik's Rupture and Reconstruction, which was written in the 90s, I just published, it was just published in the last edition of Tradition Magazine, my, my response to that from a Sephardi perspective, in which I indicate 
that when we came out of the Arab lands, because what happened was after the expulsion, both from Spain and then later Portugal, and many of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews sailed across the Mediterranean basin and, and rested and, and, and found refuge in lands with or along the Mediterranean. Many of them were able to continue the way of life and the manner in which they lived in Spain. A life that embraced society, art, science, medicine. They found that there was an ability to be able to continue that for the most part, with few exceptions. But something else occurred. And so I was talking, I got into that because of talking about self-consciousness. If you fast forward a thousand years, give or take, and you find ourselves to you know, where we are today. Well, it's not a thousand years from the expulsion, obviously. I'm talking about from the very beginnings of being in Spain separation between Sephardim and Ashkenazim. But if you, you, let's say you fast forward 300 years from 1492, give or take, and then an enlightenment happens in the Western world, which for the Ashkenazim affects them different ways in different places. The Western European Jews do not respond to the Enlightenment in the way the Eastern European Jews do. Different countries respond differently. And the Western Sfaradim respond differently. The Sfaradim in England, the Sfaradim in Amsterdam, the Sfaradim in Italy respond to the Enlightenment differently. And I claim, I suggest that the rupture of the Enlightenment that Professor Soloveitchik suggests uh, the, the Enlightenment caused to many Ashkenazi societies was less of a rupture and perhaps more of a tremor for Western Sephardi because they had always been immersed in society and the world and study of that kind. I'm speaking in broad strokes now because of the time, but I address it more in that, in that, in that article, in that essay, which I'm happy to... Uh, to send a, a, a link to. But when all of that was going on in, this, in the Eastern world, the Middle Eastern world, there was no touch of enlightenment. It was very faint, if any, perhaps with the French, a bit of the Alliance, but they were not shaken and upturned by the enlightenment in the East. And so when they did come to the West, when the Sfaradim of those places, the Middle Eastern Jews came to the West, whether to the United States or for that matter to Israel, right? In other words, they're already in Israel. Who's coming to Israel? The Ashkenazim are coming in, right? So there's a, an East meets West in that way, in the opposite manner, or in Europe, there is a self-consciousness that the Sfaradim of the East have because they come into the West for all intents and purposes unenlightened and don't really know how to engage in the Western world. And so there is a great feeling that what it is that I have, what it is the manner in which I've approached the world is unacceptable. And what I'm saying is that not only is it acceptable, it is age old and it has manifested differently and engaged differently over the generations. And so I'll show you, for example, you know, that this is the case, this is the way that we've thought, not only from Harambam, but for example, and I'll answer, um, I'll answer some questions towards the end because I see some are coming through.
You take a look at the Chovot HaLevavot, Rabbi Rabbi bin Pakuda. And where he says, you know, there's this question as to whether we're obligated to look at the world and to study it, and from that know God. He says, By the way, the Chovot HaLevavot, which is a well-known book, written by Rabbi Rabbi bin Pakuda, which, was, which preceded Harambam, Harambam wrote in a letter that the book was so beloved by his father that it never left his desk, it never left his table. He always had the Chavot HaLevavot on his table, uh, Rambam's father. You know, you ask whether we have to look at what the creations themselves, to study the creations themselves or not. I'll tell you that to look at the creations themselves and through that to be able to discover the wisdom of God is an obligation for us. It's an obligation on three fronts. First of all, it's an obligation, mina muskal. It's just reasonable to say that. I mean, if he's the one who created it, then through that you understand him. Mina katuv, there are psukim that show that this is what we're supposed to do, right? Is it not barachin avshir right? We look at up to the heavens and we recognize that, that the shamaim is ma'asetz be'otecha, the work of your fingers, the work of your hands. Ere shamecha ma'asetz be'otecha, I see your heavens, the work of your hands and how great you are. And I, we find it from the Kabbalah. Kabbalah doesn't mean Kabbalah in the way that we mean it today. Kabbalah means it's been passed on in from generation to generation. And that's what we're supposed to do. That we are supposed to recognize that what is in this world was created by God. And therefore, it's something we should study and understand. And that means that we don't just examine it. And this is an important point because it then comes into understanding where the culture of the Sephardim comes from, where the relationship to physical life among the Sephardim comes from. We don't just study it like lab professors, because we don't just look at it with white coats and sterile gloves and examine the specimens of creation. We recognize instead that we ourselves are modes of that very creation, that everything around us comes from one source, that we are meant to not just know it intellectually, but we are meant to experience it spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, holistically. And because of that, there is this joie de vivre that is very much part of Sephardic life in which things like food and music needs to hold its robust, intricate, detailed beauty and splendor. The richness needs to be maintained at all costs because if we compromise the richness, we compromise the luster of God. And it must be recognized and celebrated. And it also means that it is not enough simply to study science. Because everybody tries to get out of this and say, well, yes, no, you should study science. Absolutely, study science. You know, And therefore, you study God's world. That's not enough. Like I said, who created Rembrandt? So you don't just study the art of Rembrandt, you study the mind of Rembrandt. Because who made that? Did that come from some other source? Do I not come to know God by studying the mind of Maimonides and Lehavdil to separate between the two because I don't mean to compare them, to study the mind of Mozart? to understand what this man's thinking was that created these works to whatever degree that I can, not only to, to, to study his works. It's like the Ramchal did, Rabbi Moshe Haim Luzato, an Italian Rav of 18th century who did live in the, in the Renaissance and who did live in the Enlightenment. He wrote 
This is an unknown, this is a very, you know, not a widely known uh, detail about the Ramchal's life and work. He wrote three morality plays. He was an expert of the Hebrew language, first of all, but second of all, he wrote three morality plays in order to be able to get his points across. He immersed himself in theater. This is the Mesilat Yasharim, yeah? This is the author of the Mesilat Yasharim. Died at 39 years old in, 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 in Akko. But he wrote these because he believed that it was part of the expression of humanity. And it was the way that the human beings were thinking and engaging at the time. And so he did. Look them up. Three. Three morality ways. I have them. I'm going to stop for questions, but I'm going to wrap up by saying this. It is not something that we should be self-conscious about. Our desire, our legacy, our culture, to embrace the world that God created, to find the joy in it, to find the love of God in it to commit ourselves, not to dabble in it for its sake, but to engage in it for his sake. And to be able to raise it in holiness. There is a caveat. Like I suggested and hinted to at the beginning. The children of Yaakov Avinu were not superfluous in their, in their concerns. They were right that there are dangers in the path that I am suggesting or that I am delineating because it's not something that I personally am suggesting. Like I said, it's age old. There are toxins in the world. Not everything is meant for human consumption. And I don't just mean oral consumption. I mean mental consumption emotional consumption, spiritual consumption. There are toxins in the world. Those toxins are outlined for us by the Torah. When the Torah says to us, do not eat this, do not watch this, do not read this, do not look at this, it is telling us for a reason. The Torah doesn't want to keep us away from the world and does not want to keep us away from God. It wants to keep us away from toxins. Why are there toxins? Why is it that human beings cannot consume all things? That's for another discussion. The reality is, though, that you know, as I do, that we cannot. And we must be careful with hubris in thinking that we can. And we must be careful with hubris in discerning what it is that we can and we cannot. And that requires guidance. And it requires study. And that is why it is not enough to study the world. We must study Torah. Because it is the lens through which we see the world. It is our primary source. And it is our guide. And it has always been our guide. And to forsake the Torah is just as much, if not more, of a forsaking of our culture and heritage and history as it is to forsake the world. They were given to us in tandem, together. And so it is important for us to know it in order to be able to be engage in the endeavor with appropriate purpose, aim, and recognition of the toxins in the world that we have to be aware of when we dive into and immerse ourselves into it joyfully. Next time, please God, we will talk about today, where we are at and what we might uh, look at in terms of our, our approach. Shall I, I, so I received questions privately. That's why I don't think we see them on the chat. I'm gonna take a quick look at them. Okay, one is a uh, thank you. Okay, that's lovely. And then there's one. 
Yeah, so there's one that's a question about the Karaites, uh, which I'm happy to answer, but I'm not going to answer today because it's a bit off of the topic of what it is that we're discussing. So with that, I give it back to you, Ethan, if that's all right. Unless there are any other questions that anybody wants to ask at the time, with time permitting. There are a few questions actually also I got in the chat as well. So first okay. of all, thank you so much. Okay. Your amazing, amazing classes. Okay. He's enjoying them as well. Okay. Um, first question here, um, actually just on the last point that you mentioned about toxins. Yeah. How do you then respond to, let's say people in the Sephardic world, certainly in the, but of course in the Ashkenazic world who take it, take that issue of toxins and outlining toxin in the Torah to its logical extreme by saying, if this toxin is not allowed, then obviously this thing could lead to that, that could lead to eventually going down a bad path. How do you then respond to those people by saying, well, you know what, that's not what the Torah means. Instead, that take the Sephardic approach, this is what it means. How do you deal with that kind of tension between wanting to just put up barriers as opposed to- You deal with that tension from a place of reason. First of all, thank you for the question. You deal with that tension from a place of reason and recognize that what it means to do that, right? What it means essentially to, to, to look at the entire world as potential danger, yeah? And a challenge that you should not be distracted with is to live in fear. And the Torah does not ever command us to live in fear. To the contrary, it tells us that we should be strong and bold and stand and walk with God. So the only thing the Torah cautions us against is not to be too arrogant and to think that you're the God and walk that way. To always know kochi ve'otzim yadi is never asali at ha'yel azeh, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that gives you the koch la'asot ha'yel, that gives you the strength to do all of the great things that you do. But you are not to live as a coward. And, and the reason why is because you end up losing out on your own life and on the life and the world around you. And so I always point out, there's one way to look at it, right? Also, Sephardi tradition. You know, take Yom Kippur as an example. Yom Kippur, this day in which we do pull ourselves away from the world, right? It's the one day, the one day of the entire year that the Torah commands us, deprive yourself. And how do we spend that day? We spend that day in tremendous holiness and prayer. We bow and we sing. And we talk about God as being Adonai Hu Elohim, He is the Lord. And part of that day, if we are completely honest, yeah, is to recognize that we cannot live that kind of day more than 24 hours. Because if you're like anyone else I've seen in synagogue for my entire life, there is a point where I catch you flipping your machzor to see how many more pages we have left until the day is over and we can go have bagels for dinner. And you think that that's something you're supposed to do privately and be ashamed of. But the reality is, is that's precisely what it is. That is also part of Yom Kippur. You're supposed to recognize you're not meant to live that way. And the indication that you're not meant to live that way is the last, last line of our prayers, of our liturgy. And I mean the Sephardi liturgy, the Ashkenazim don't have it. What is the last thing that we say on Yom Kippur? It is not Adonai Hu Elohim. The last closing line that we say on Yom Kippur is to the tzibur, is to the people. Go eat your bread with joy. And drink your wine with a glad heart. God has accepted everything you've done. Go enjoy dinner. That's the last thing on Yom Kippur. I mean, can't you leave it on the high before we leave shul, before we leave synagogue? You've got, you can't leave it at the Nayu Elohim. It's got to be go enjoy dinner, really eat with gusto, you know? that That's the last note. Yes, that is the last note of Yom Kippur. Because you are meant to realize, I don't belong here. I belong in the world. And that's what Yom Kippur is for, because if you're going to throw yourself with gusto in the world, there's bound to be missteps here and there. Not intentional, not malicious, but there's going to bound to be missteps. So incorporated in that is a day to address those things. It's why the Gemara says in Yoma, the next day in the old days, when the Kohen Gadol was the only one doing anything, it says that Kohen Gadol would meet up with the guy who had to send the Azazel to the Midbar, right? That was the only thing going on on Yom Kippur. You had the Kohen Gadol doing the service and the man who took the scapegoat, right? The Azazel to the Midbar. They would meet the next day. And this was only one time a year that God was referred to in the following way. 
the man who took the Azizel would say to the Kohen Gadol, Mehaye Hayim, talking about God, meaning the one who enlivens life. Asinu Shlichuto. Why is God referred to as Mehaye Hayim the day after Yom Kippur? Because after a 24 hour Yom Kippur, the taste of the fruit, the feeling of the lotion on your skin, the shower is sweeter and you feel more alive. So it is not the way that we are meant to live. And it's clear from the Torah that it's not the way they're meant to live. We are not meant to live in fear. And we are not meant to live in a way that deprives ourselves. And Harambam is posik this very, very clearly in the in Hilchot Deod in the fourth period. So that's another, that. Another question here, actually, specifically on Harambam. How do you think Harambam would, what do you think Harambam would say about today's Judaism and today's Jewish world? When it comes to kind of these issues. I'm not Harambam, and so I am not presumptuous to assume what it is that he would say. All I could say is that there it is likely that Harambam would see the Jewish world today and see certain things that were quite positive and and valuable. He would want to learn knowing the Rambam, he would really want to understand what people were thinking, what was going on, and why things are the way that they are. And I think that he would see a lot of things that would very much disappoint him as well. I think that he would see both. But I think ultimately that Harambam would look at Am Yisrael as God's people. And that he would have Rahamim on them and care for them. As he said many times before, there's you got to be very careful speaking about the Jewish people. You get kamapt when you speak inappropriately about them. And he has, an, he has a teshubah about this. And he says, look, look at the evidence. You know, you look at the Nevi'im that spoke not nicely and people that spoke badly about us. Kadosh Baruch Hu didn't treat them well. So he may be critical. He may think that we need to do things differently. He may be unhappy about some of the things and approaches to Judaism, legal, uh, halachic elements that we engage in, as well as philosophical elements. But I think that there are many things that he would look at it and be astounded at how it is that we've managed to stay on all this long and how things have developed from his time 900 years ago. Uh, one last question here. I think we'll wrap up here. Where do you think the logical conclusion goes from this in a sense that where do we go from here as Sephardic Jews? How do we take this and actualize it? That's next week or next next lecture. So you got to stay tuned. Oh, and one last question also just popped up. I'm sorry. Um, at the expulsion, weren't these two schools of thought from those that followed the philosophy of the Rambam and those are the direct interpretations of the Midrash? Were yeah. they there were two schools of thought. Say again. Um, weren't there two schools of thought from those who followed the philosophy of the Rambam and those who directly interpreted the Midrash? If you mean by directly interpreted Midrash, understood Midrash literally, as opposed to how Rambam studied Midrash, that's always been the case. It's not just that there were two schools of thought after the expulsion. There's always been these, you know, this, I mean, as long as there's been people who've studied Midrash. There were people who tended to look at the Midrash as literal literal parables and expressions. And Harambam cautioned against that. And there's a good reason why Harambam cautioned against that. If I understand the question correctly, I could be misunderstanding the question, but if I understand what be, what's being asked, then yes, there were two different ways of looking at it. But Harambam looked at it, and I'm speaking from Harambam's perspective in these lectures, he looked at that as being terribly uh, mistaken. And that it was not, and he wrote very clearly why it was mistaken, which we won't get into now. But he writes in the in the introduction to to the um, to Perakhelik in the in the Perusha Mishnah. Okay, with that, I want to thank Rabbi Direct so much again for this wonderful, wonderful course. Um, please, all everyone, join us for the last in the three part series. Um, excuse me, in two weeks uh, on December 8th, it'll be the same time, same place using the same link, you know, same virtual place, of course. Um, and we wish everybody well, God willing, we should all be safe and healthy, especially at this difficult time. Wish everybody uh, a wonderful day. Rabbi Durak, thank you so much again. My honor and pleasure. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, everyone. Good to have you. Good to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.